Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of Live from Noir Lab at Kit Peak. I'm your host, Rob Sparks, and we have our moderator, Jamika Marshall, with us today. Today, we have a really special guest, and I'm very excited about it. Zhao Sheng Huang will talk about strong gravitational lensing in the DESI Legacy Imaging Survey. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, enter them in the chat box, and we will relay them to our guest. First, I'd like to tell you about Kit Peak National Observatory. Kit Peak is funded by the National Science Foundation and is a NOAA lab facility. It was founded in 1958. It's located about 55 miles southwest of Tucson on land leased from the Tona Otham Nation. We are indebted to them for letting us use one of their sacred mountains for astronomical research. Kit Peak is home to over two dozen optical telescopes as well as two radio telescopes. And we always like starting off each program with a quick um, news item, recent news item from our facilities. And this week is particularly appropriate because we recently started the DESI survey on Kit Peak. A quest to map the universe and unravel the mysteries of dark energy officially began on May 17th, 2021, just a couple weeks ago, at Kit Peak National Observatory. Over the next five years, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, DESI, will capture light from tens of millions of galaxies and other cosmic objects. During its four-month trial run, which just concluded, the project already collected millions of observations. In fact, I just saw a, an update that said a couple, night or two ago they collected 26 observations, and since each observation is 5,000 fibers, that's over 100,000 uh, observations in just one night. By gathering light from some 30 million galaxies, project scientists say that DESI will help them construct a 3D map of the universe in unprecedented detail. DESI will do this by collecting spectra, which spread the light from celestial objects into the colors of the rainbow, revealing information such as the chemical composition of objects being observed and the relative distances and velocities. This data will help astronomers better understand the repulsive force associated with dark energy, which drives the acceleration of the universe's expansion across vast cosmic distances. DESI is a little bit different than a lot of projects. It's an international science collaboration managed by the U.S. Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, also known as Berkeley Lab, with primary funding from the department, department's Office of Science. DESI resides at the Nicholas U. Mayo 4 meter telescope at Kitt Peak National Observatory. For more information, we'll put the press release in the chat here as well as in our show notes. So you can look that up if you'd like to. So finally, I'd like to introduce our, no, without further ado, let's get on to our speaker for the day. Dr. Uh, Dr. Zhao Sheng Wang received his PhD from UC Berkeley in condensed matter physics in 2004. And I love this next part. He took the unusual step and started a postdoctoral position in astrophysics at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Since 2012, he's been a faculty member in the Physics and Astronomy Department at the University of San Francisco. He continues to work on problems in observational cosmology with collaborators in the Supernova Cosmology Project, the nearby Supernova Factory, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, and of course, with students. So I'd like to welcome Zhao Sheng Wang to uh, today. Good afternoon. Hi, Rob. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today? Doing well. Yourself? Okay, super. I'll let you start sharing your screen. And remember, you can put your questions and comments as we go along in the chat, and we will relay them to our guests so you can get those answered as we go along. So no need to wait till the end. Okay, sounds great. All right, so I hope everybody can see the slide, the first slide. So uh, the introduction that Rob gave, thank you. Uh, and also the news item uh, fits perfectly uh, with today's talk. So I will be telling you about the strong gravitational lenses discovered in the DESI legacy imaging surveys. And uh, so I did ask Rob a little bit about uh, the audience, and I've been told that you are a, a well-informed audience. And uh, so I have decided to um, go into a little bit uh, technical detail just for you to see how um, these kinds of searches uh, were actually uh, carried out. Uh, but I also know that the technical side of things can uh, sound a little bit boring, even though you know this is really how discoveries are made. Uh, but nevertheless, I will try to um, um, get to the discovery parts uh, as quickly as I can. So just so you know, the first part of the talk is a little bit about the technical side, and then uh, we will talk about what we have found. So here we go. Um, so first of all, let me acknowledge my collaborators. Um, 
They are from various institutions, including the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, as Rob mentioned, and also uh, the Noir Lab, where uh, Rob and uh, Jamika work at, uh, as well as Lawrence Livermore National Lab, the European Southern Observatories, the Institute for Physics and Mathematics of the Universe in Tokyo, and the University of Hawaii. Uh, I also work with a large group of very talented undergraduate students. Uh, most of them are from UC Berkeley and the University of San Francisco. Uh, I do have a student uh, for the last year from Princeton. Um, and uh, this work could not have happened uh, without the contributions, the significant contributions from these students. So uh, let me first of all um, give you a very brief introduction of what is gravitational lensing. It is a ra very rare phenomenon. Uh, it happens when a background galaxy, far away galaxy, and the foreground galaxy, typically a very massive dead red galaxy and an observer on Earth are nearly lined up. When that happens, the gravity of the foreground galaxy can warp space-time according to general relativity. And that would make possible for photons from the background galaxy to reach the observer on Earth through two or more paths. And therefore, to the observer on Earth, there appears to be, in this case, two images, two phantom images of the same background galaxy, which is no longer observable. All the astronomer sees on Earth are these two ghost images, phantom images. And the foreground galaxy on the CCD of a telescope typically appears as a red blob. And as I said, this is very rare. It happens for about one in 10,000 ma massive galaxies. And the result of lensing is typically very large distorted arcs and often multiple images of the same background galaxy. OK. Uh, oh, by the way, so as Rob said, uh, interrupt me anytime um, if you have a question uh, or comment. Um, so strong gravitational lensing is a fantastic demonstration of the space-time distortion by gravity according to general relativity. Um, on top of that, they can also be used to address some of the most fundamental questions in cosmology and physics. So I'll just give you two examples here. One is that Strong lensing provides direct tests of dark matter model, models, in particular, uh, specific predictions from the, the prevailing dark matter model called the cold dark matter model. Um, and it can also be used to measure the expansion rate of the universe, or the Hubble constant, and it is represented by the symbol H0. And um, so before I go on to uh, talk about how that can be accomplished, uh, I see Jamaica, which means uh, there may be a question. Yes, thank you so much. You are absolutely right. Okay, so in the chat, we have our first question. It's from Chimmy Torres. And Chimmy asks, I wonder, or really makes a statement uh, that I think you can respond to, I wonder when a telescope using the sun as a lens will be made. Yes, so the first uh, observation of this phenomenon, uh, indeed, in that instance, the sun was the lens. Uh, and so this was uh, observed by uh, Sir Eddington uh, and uh, you can uh, uh, Google it. Um, and this is, in fact, uh, I believe it was 1919 observation. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's possible. However, the uh, lensing effect due to the sun is much, much, much weaker than the lensing effect due to a galaxy. A galaxy typically has 100 billion stars. So together, the lensing power is much greater due to a galaxy compared with a single star. Could, could I chime in here? 
for a second. Alas, in 2019, for the total solar eclipse that passed over Chile, it passed over Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory, and myself, Juan Segel, who is at Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory, and some students from the University of La Serena set up a telescope to recreate the Ed Eddington experiment down there. And if you look at our um, uh, previous live from the Royal Lab last July, where we had the one-year anniversary eclipse, we talked about that experiment there. So we talk, go talk about that in much more detail there if you're interested in that. We'll put that note. We'll put that link in our show notes too. But if Jamaica's is real fast, you might be able to find it and put it in the chat here. So I'll let you continue. I just thought that'd be an interesting thing to plot, bring in there. A, a better updated answer. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. So how can strong lensing be used to test dark matter models? Um, well, for now, I will just say that our understanding today is that a galaxy is embedded in the dark matter halo. And in fact, much of the warping power uh, of space-time comes from dark matter and not visible matter. So I'll talk more about that later. Uh, and how can strong lensing be used to measure Hubble constant? Well, so imagine if the background galaxy has a supernova explosion. Uh, well, I should point to this. If a super, supernova explosion happens in the background galaxy, well, guess what? That same explosion will happen in both images. And furthermore, you can calculate how long it takes for photons to reach the observer through these two different paths. And in most cases, the time it takes for the photons to arrive at the observer on Earth, that time is going to be different depending on which path you calculate for it. And what that means is that you will see the supernova exploding twice. And the time difference between these two explosions is proportional to the inverse H naught or the inverse expansion rate of the universe. Um, and uh, so, as I said, uh, these are some of the uh, most important questions in cosmology today. All right, so how do we find these systems? And so this is probably one of the few most technical slides. So I'm going to uh, walk a little bit. I'm gonna slow down a little bit uh, because I think it really is very interesting. Um, and so it's been known for the last five to 10 years that neural networks are very, very good at uh, recognizing features in the image. So what do I, what do I mean by uh, recognizing? Uh, and and uh, so I actually should, um, say that uh, the, uh, the, the applications that uh, people typically are aware of, of convolutional neural net networks, is the image recognition of terrestrial images. And, uh, and we would like to apply convolutional neural networks to astronomical images. Um, and here I'm going to pause uh, and hear what uh, Jamika has for me. Thank you again. Yes, so in the chat, we have Ariel Vallejos. Um, and so Ariel says, hello, everybody. The test is based on the measurement of dark matter that we have from galaxies. It is not an independent test of those data, is it? Can you say the question one more time? Sure. <clears throat> Ariel says, um, this test, the test, um, I assume of the gravitational lensing uh, is based on the measurement of dark matter that we have from galaxies. It is not, however, an independent test of those data, is it? So that was his question. And I'll drop it in the chat so that it's clear for you as well. All right, thanks. So I'm gonna try my best uh, based on my uh, understanding of that question. Um, so the, the existence of dark matter uh, has been uh, provided observationally from several dif different aspects in the last, um, depending on how you count, 80 years or so, if you think that Zwicky was the first one that proposed dark matter in 1937, I think. Um, so I am talking about going one step beyond that, which is that we know that there is dark matter. Then the question is, what is dark matter? And so people have come up with different models for what dark matter is, and therefore how it would behave uh, when it comes to bending light, for example, or bending warping space and time. And so strong lensing is a way to test 
uh, to see which dark matter models predictions are in disagreement with strong lensing observations and which are which ones are in agreement. So if that's not clear, uh, if, if I'm not addressing the question you asked, please feel free, feel, feel free to ask one more time, uh, maybe rephrase a little bit so that I'll have, have a better chance of uh, uh, understanding um, uh, the, the question. Thank Thanks. you so much. That was a fantastic answer. And yes, Ariel, uh, drop it in the chat if you need more clarification. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, so um, as, I as I was saying that um, uh, people have been using uh, convolutional, neural net neur convolutional neural networks, I will probably start to use uh, the acronym CNN um, from now on. So people have been using CNN to do image recognition and classification for terrestrial objects uh, for quite a while now. And these days, um, CNNs are doing as well as the human eye, if not better. And so I'm uh, obviously I can't go into uh, too much detail, but this is a schematic of how a CNN works. On the left hand side is the input image. The image may contain a car or a truck or an airplane or a ship or a horse. And the goal of this algorithm is to be able to tell whether the object in the image is a car versus a truck or some other objects. And the way this works uh, very roughly is that you pretend that you don't look at the image uh, all at once. So the image has, you know, these days, even your phone camera can capture images that have, that have millions of pixels. You don't look at all these pixels at the same time. What you do is you imagine you design a tiny, tiny window uh, and you only look at a very small part of the image at a time. And not only that, but the level of transparency of that window is different depending on uh, you know, which part of the window uh, you're looking through. And so that window is called a kernel or a filter. And so what you do is you move the filter across the image, uh, across the image, and you scan the image from, you know, let's say top left all the way to bottom right. Um, and that gives you uh, a, um, a different version. You know, the information is now passed through, the information from that original image now gets passed through that little window that you have, right? So that gives you another image. Uh, and let's say if you design five different kinds of kernels, then each kernel will give you a different version of the image. And then you get what's, uh, in this case, you would get five channels. Each channel corresponds to a very specialized window that you design. And when you do that, you also reduce the size of the image. And so typically in a CNN, the number of channels increases and the size, the dimension of the image decreases. So this is one convolutional layer. When you go into the next convolutional layer, the same thing happens again. And in this case, once again, you see that the dimension of the image gets reduced, but the number of channel increases. And this whole process, and so you can do this over and over again, uh, basically stack convolutional layers one on top of the other. And this process is often called feature extraction. So the idea is that through this process, the algorithm can isolate features that in aggregate correspond to a car versus features in aggregate correspond to a ship and so forth. And then at the very last, at the very end of this chain, you use a traditional neural network, what's called a fully connected layer. So you no longer look at the image uh, one little part of the time. You look at the entire output uh, at the previous layer all at once. And that allows you to classify based on the features that have been extracted, whether the image contains a car or a truck or something else. And as I said, this has been done um, and uh, for terrestrial images and it performs very, very well. And uh, so the height of the bar in this case corresponds to uh, the probability that the neural network thinks that it's a frog. Um, and so in this case, uh, 
it thinks it's a deer, uh, it's really a bird. Uh, whereas in this case, it correctly classified the image as a frog and so forth. So now we would like to do this. We would like to use this technique uh, to classify uh, astronomical images. And uh, I will tell you a few things about why it is that that uh, makes the problem much harder. But before that, let me tell you one other thing, which is that we're going to use a very specialized architecture. Uh, there's a lot of details here, so I won't go into all the details, but I will just tell you a couple interesting things. One is that what, so every block is a convolutional, uh, is a block of convolutional layers. Uh, it actually has three convolutional layers, and there are many, many blocks stepped on, uh, stacked on top of each other. So let's just zoom in. Let's just look at one of these blocks. As I said, it has three convolutional uh, layers. And what makes this architecture special is that you make sure that what comes out of this end, uh, this uh, output has the same dimension as the input. And so then you can add the input to the output and then you pass a sum to uh, the next block. And it turns out that if you do this, it allows you to build a very deep neural network. And so you may have heard of the word of deep learning or deep neural network, and that's what's meant. You have many, many layers stacked on, stacked on top of each other. And it's because of this special design that makes this architecture possible and successful. And one other thing I want to talk a little bit about is that you want the neural network to be able to recognize a car versus a truck, whether the car is um, you know, sitting flat uh, whether the image is uh, has the um, tip, you know, the typical orientation of you know up is away from the surface of the Earth, right? If you tilt that image, let's say you know in San Francisco, the cars are parked at forty five degree angles. Well, that's still a car. Um, so you rotate the image and you mirror the image, right? Whether the car is facing east or west shouldn't matter. And you zoom in a little bit, whether it's a big car, a small car, or a car at a you know a, a, a great distance or a car that's very close to you. So you do all these things, and these are called image augmentation. So what you do is you take an image of a car and you perform all these transformations on them and you label each image as a car uh, um, to show the neural network that these operations should not affect how you label the car, how you classify the car. Okay, I think that's probably all I need to say. If you have other questions about other things on the slide, feel free to ask me now or later. Um, okay, so the observations, where uh, do we get our data? Well, we were very fortunate because as Rob explained, the DESI experiment, the dark energy, dark energy spectroscopic instrument experiment has just begun. Uh, but in a few years uh, before this, before this summer, uh, if you want to, so remember the experiment, the DESI experiment aims to measure uh, spectra of millions of galaxies. But before you can do that, you first have to know where the galaxies are. And so uh, a team of astronomers um, started this campaign to image one third of the sky. So this is um, uh, uh, how big the footprint is on the sky. It covers 14,000 square degrees. Um, and it is so large that it has to be done on three separate telescopes in order to complete the project in a reasonable amount of time, which is about five to six years. So the southern part, um, so that is the part of the, the, the survey that's below uh, 32 degrees uh, declination on the sky, which is basically the projection of the 32, uh, the, the 32 degree um, latitude onto uh, onto the sky. Uh, so this part, which has a, has the red outline, is carried out by the Blanco telescope in Chile. Uh, and the northern part, which has the green outline, uh, is carried out by two separate telescopes, the Mayol telescope in uh, one of the filters, and then the 2.3 Bach telescope in the other two filters. And so if you're a photographer, you may know that sometimes um, you don't just take the image 
um, in the entire uh, optical spectrum, but you, uh, uh, you, you, you add a, 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 a filter uh, to look at a narrower range of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this survey is carried out in three filters or three bands, astronomers call them. The G band, which you can think of it as sort of green, uh, R band, uh, which is you know corresponds to the red part of the uh, rainbow um, spectrum, and then the Z band, uh, which is really the near infrared, so it's just redder than the uh, human eye sensitivity. So uh, the in this footprint, every part of this footprint has observations in each of these three bands, G, R, and Z. And the observation conditions is a little bit better for the southern part than the northern part. Okay, so um, the team that has carried out this imaging survey, which is called the legacy imaging surveys, and I'll probably be referring to uh, this survey simply as the legacy surveys, uh, is truly um, enormous. It contains, so, they release the data uh, at uh, different stages of the observation. And when we first started this project, um, this team just uh, did their data release seven or DR7. And at DR7, there are 835 million objects. And we we're also um, um, very fortunate because uh, a sub-team uh, also identified all the objects in this observation. And more than that, they even typed every object to the best, uh, uh, to the, it, um, well, depending on the observation condition, uh, they, 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 they did the best they could. And so for 30 million of these objects, they are identified as elliptical galaxies. And so don't worry about what the, you know, what the, uh, what the EV stands for. And another two million objects, uh, which also are more or less elliptical galaxies. So these are the red dead galaxies that are very massive and that are uh, uh, more likely to be gravitational lenses than other types of galaxies. And that's the type of galaxies that we would like to focus on. Uh, they, also, they also identify 75 million uh, ellip uh, spiral galaxies which uh, they've called EXP. So the EXPs are the spiral galaxies. And then there are another 330 million galaxies that they could tell that these were galaxies, but they couldn't tell you whether they were elliptical, ga elliptical galaxies or spiral galaxies. So they are called the Rex galaxies. I'm sorry about all the acronyms. Um, and then 400 million, basically, stars. And so as I said, we will be focusing on the elliptical galaxies, which are the DEV uh, or the COMP. OK, so um, as I uh, mentioned earlier, to do uh, this kind of image classification using astronomical images, it turns out to be a harder problem compared with terrestrial images. So why is that? So let me go through a few reasons. Uh, the first is that. Remember, only one in 10,000 galaxies is a lens. So before our search, at the time when our search started, there were only about a few hundred lenses, known lenses, confirmed lenses. And so unlike for terrestrial problem, you can train a neural net by using lots and lots of images of cars, for example, or trucks or ships. Whereas in our case, there really only there were really only a few hundred lenses when we started this project. And on top of that, for an image that contains a lens, less than 10% of the pixels correspond to the feature that you're looking for. So let me give you an example. So this is an example of a instance of gravitational lensing. The red galaxy is a lens. The blue arcs are two images of the same background galaxy. This small galaxy here is not lensing. There's nothing behind it. So you don't see the blue uh, arcs around it. This galaxy too, it's just um, sitting there by itself. There's, there's nothing behind it. However, this galaxy, again, 
it has a galaxy sitting behind it, and that galaxy, that far away background galaxy, has been distorted into this beautiful arc. Same thing here. This is the arc uh, that uh, help that that makes this a gravitational lensing instance, and this is the main lens, a very massive galaxy, whereas these objects are not lenses. So you can see that only a very small percentage of the pixels uh, are what makes this a lensing image versus a non-lens image. Um, and one more reason is that the lensed arcs, as you can see, are quite a bit fainter uh, than other images, the foreground galaxy. So this is the gravitational lens image of a background galaxy, and these arcs are much fainter than the foreground galaxies. Um, and so, again, compare this with the terrestrial scenario. If you want to recognize a car, the car is not any fainter than surrounding objects, right? Streets or buildings. Whereas in this case, the feature that we're looking for is quite a bit fainter than uh, other objects in the same image. Now, you may say, well, what if we use simulations? Well, the short answer is that the simulations today are still not realistic enough. And then one other thing uh, which I'll touch on later is that the neural net actually is very good at finding shortcuts. Um, as I said, I'll come back to this later. Okay, so we decided that for our training sample, we'll use observed images, we'll use as many lenses and even lens candidates as long as they look convincing, we'll use as many of these uh, either lenses or candidates as possible. We'll carefully select non-lenses, and uh, we will. We also plan to increase the number of lenses in our training sample over time. And uh, we had this hunch that if we use observed images instead of simulations, uh, we can probably be. We will probably uh, be successful because. Um, these images are probably more potent compared with simulated images. And it turns out that that hunch was correct. Okay, so at data release seven, the observation is not yet complete. And uh, what I'm showing you here is I'm using the number of passes in Z-band uh, as, a, as a proxy to show you uh, how completed the survey is. So every part of the sky uh, in the red out outline or in the green outline uh, should be observed three times. And each observation is called a pass. Um, and as you can see at data release seven, uh, parts of the sky uh, still haven't been observed. And there are other parts of the sky that has only been observed once or twice. Um, and so, um, the uh, number of observations or passes in Z-band, as I, as I said, tells us uh, tells you how complete the survey is at the time of DR7, which is about 2018. And earlier I said the observation conditions are a little bit better for the southern part of the footprint uh, in the red outline compared with the part of the sky that's observed in the green outline. So we will focus, we focused our search on just the southern part. And so that's why I've left this part of the sky empty for now. Okay. And uh, I also mentioned that we wanted to carefully select the examples, the uh, uh, images for non-lenses. And the reason for that is we want the neural network to not be confused by images that are not, uh, that are not lenses. Um, uh, so that it will successfully classify them as non-lenses. So here are a few examples. This is a spiral galaxy. The spiral galaxy shares a, uh, a, a similar quality as a lensing system in that it also has a red object at the, at the center and some blue stuff around it, right? Uh, this is another example. So we use spiral galaxies and label them as non-lenses. And we also don't want the uh, neural network to think that 
uh, elliptical galaxies by themselves are good enough. So we feed a lot of elliptical galaxies just by themselves. We also label these as not lenses. And these are basically uh, lots of galaxies. And the reason for that is because a lensed image, a lensing uh, 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 instance, sometimes would have multiple images. And uh, so it could make the image look busy. So we want the neural network to not confuse a busy image as a, a, a lensing instance. And this column corresponds to images that have a red galaxy and a blue galaxy. So just because there's a blue galaxy next to a red galaxy, that doesn't mean that it's strong lensing. Here are cosmic rays. These are uh, probably galaxy merging events. So they're interesting to other astronomers, but not to us. And finally, artifacts. So we've, we have found about 3,000 of these kinds of images, and we labeled each one as not a lens. And then we're going to train the neural network. And so for uh, uh, so every image, every cutout image is 101 pixels and 101 pixels on the side. Uh, and we divide these images into the training set and the validation set. Actually, don't worry about the testing set. Just focus on the training set and the validation set. And I will um, explain uh, what the difference is. So Rob, go ahead. Yes, I, I'm, I'm actually monitoring our face, Facebook live chat and we have a uh, well, comments that I'm going to, a question I'm going to ask here quickly um, yes. about the DESI survey. It says, I heard it takes about five years to complete the research. I assume that means the survey. And one, Alexis Ritual, one, what are the phases of completing this survey? Yeah, so, so, so first of all, um, good, great questions. So the uh, imaging process took about five years. Um, the data reduction took another a year or so. Our search, uh, let me think. So we've done two searches and I'll, I'll talk about both of them. Uh, each search took about uh, six months or so. And then another six months to uh, finalize our discoveries and write up the paper. So yeah, that's a time scale, about uh, one year for uh, the two search that we've done. Uh, and then the last question was about, what was it again? The second question? What, what are the phases of the research? Right. So, yeah, so uh, I have to, I don't know what the uh, criteria that the imaging uh, team set for data releases. Uh, but there are many uh, public surveys these days that will do periodic data releases even before the survey is complete. And Noir Lab is fantastic about uh, making phenomenal astronomical data, uh, 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 make, make them available to the public. Um, for us, um, we um, basically timed our searches to their data releases and one thing I will also uh, talk about is how we improve from one search to the next. So I hope that uh, more or less answered the question. All right, so let's move on. Uh, so as I said, uh, we need uh, positive examples, meaning lenses uh, in the training sample. So we compile 617 known lenses. And I'm also looking at the time. I think I ought to speed up a little bit. Um, and, um, and 13,000 non-lenses. And uh, I would like to focus on those 3,000 uh, hand-selected ones. That, those took the most amount of time. The other ones, we basically uh, did a random selection. Uh, and then we split this training sample into a training set and the validation set. And so in the training set, there are 9,900 non-lenses, 423 lenses. And the validation set has 2,800 non-lenses and 118 lenses. And so the idea is that we will train the neural network, and I'll talk about what training is like in just a bit. We will train the neural network using these images, and it will evaluate the performance of the neural net, of the trained neural net using these images. 
And I see Jamika again. Hi, yes, we have um, several more questions in the YouTube chat for uh, such an engaging presentation today. Thank you. All right, so um, our first question is from Alan Jackson. Alan asks, what about using ML super resolution models on the lens to image training data in order to augment them? So um, if I understand, so Alan, right? Yes. So if I under, understand Alan correctly, there is a way, uh, there is a machine learning technique that can fill in details that are not there. Um, and uh, so if that is what Alan's referring to, uh, let me just, the, the shortest answer I can give at this point is that um, lensing is not uh, ready for that technique yet. And, uh, and basically the reason, one reason for that, so for example, there are these machine learning uh, techniques that can, you know, you can give an outline of a handbag and it will fill in the texture, the color, uh, the, the sort of the, the, the sense, the material, all that is it's magical, right? But that, to my understanding, is only possible if the neural network, if the neural network has been exposed to tons and tons and tons of handbag examples. We just don't have that many lensing examples for this to be possible. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so we have um, a few more questions. Her next one is from um, Liz Flemings. This is, uh, so, and Alan is from Tucson, by the way, just letting you know. Alan is from Tucson. And we have uh, earlier, our first question was from Chemi, who is uh, in Chile. Uh, this question is from Liz Flemings, uh, Memphis Stargazer, so from Memphis, Tennessee. And she asks, she says, since completing a survey takes about five years, uh, very similar to the question from Rob in the Facebook audience, uh, but Liz Fleming asks, what are the benchmarks that led to this conclusion, led to your conclusion since it takes so long? Uh, the conclusion of? I guess you're, you're the data that you have right now. Um, yeah. Is this data just still in process? I see. Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. So again, if I understood the question correctly, uh, from my conversations with the imaging team, uh, so what they do is that they come up with, so the uh, data, there's so much data that you have to process the image by using the algorithm. Now, after you do that, you cannot check every single part of sky to see if you've done this correctly, you've done their data reduction correctly. So what you do is you design a number of tests based on your past experience, and you select a few small areas of the sky scattered across the footprint, and you see, and you check if each part of the sky passes those tests. And if that is true, and, you f and, and uh, if that is true for all the observation that has been done up to that point, that is a point uh, of the observational process when you can consider a data release. Now, when you go to the next data release, you may set up a new criteria, new tests that your algorithm has to pass. So, you know, raise the bar even higher. So that's kind of how the data releases are done. Oh, okay. That's insightful. That's insightful. Hopefully uh, that answered your question, Liz Fleming. Okay. Um, I'll just give you two more questions and then we'll pause and let you get back to your presentation and I'll bring the next comments and questions after that. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so uh, Shimmy asks, uh, says, making a space telescope, <clears throat> and let me drop this in the chat for you to um, also see. Okay, it's there for you. It says, making a space telescope able uh, able to move uh, so you can increase the amount of galaxies uh, it's able to, to see uh, suitable to use as lenses. Uh, is that an option? Is that something that can be done? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. And I, and I actually have a, a full answer towards the end of my talk. But for now, let me just say that, this, that a space telescope is going to be great at providing highest possible resolution but it is very it is it is not nearly as good as a ground-based telescope typically speaking 
uh, not nearly as good as a ground-based telescope to be able to cover a very large amount of sky in a short amount of, in, in a short amount of, amount of time. And so, if you want to find lots of lenses, first you want a very large part of the sky uh, getting observed by uh, by a telescope. And so that's the kind of data that we have. Oh, I see. Okay. Awesome. All right. So I'll save these next two questions so you can go ahead uh, with your presentation since we're down to 15 minutes. Everyone's yeah. really into it. All right. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Great. So let me uh, say a little bit that so all the data is uh, on a supercomputing center. And the first time we, we trained it, uh, we trained it on CPU uh, and it took 17 hours. And uh, so I will probably skip this. Uh, this is how you evaluate uh, the training process and all that is done on the validation set. So remember the validation set are used to assess the performance of the neural network. And uh, for this plot, I would just say that this AUC is the area under this curve. And the higher this, the higher this number is, the better the performance. So for this, so I, so the, a perfect classifier, a neural network that can classify a lens from a non-lens with 100% success rate, then the area under this curve is going to be one. So as you can see, we didn't reach one, but we did pretty well, 0.98, right? So that's all I will say. Um, so next is, so once we have the neural network trained, we're gonna apply the neural net to millions upon millions of images to see which ones are lenses, which ones are not lenses. And this process is called inference. So we're gonna run inference on many, many objects. And in this case, we ran inference on 5.7 million objects. And each one is, as I said, 101 by 101 pixels. And uh, each one has at least three passes in each of the bands. Remember, the observation was done in GR and Z bands. So in each band, we require there are at least three passes, meaning that part of sky, the observation for that part of sky is relatively complete. And also we want bright objects. And uh, astronomers use this funny system where the magnitude, uh, the smaller the magnitude, the brighter they are. So we want to find, uh, we want to focus on objects that are bright. And the reason for that is because even though there's dark matter, for the most part, mass traces light. So a brighter galaxy is likely to be more massive than the less bright galaxy. Um, and so here I show you an example of these images of these objects. So this is a, dead, uh, a red dead galaxy it's classified as, as a dev, which is what we want. And as you can see, the Z band is brighter than 20th magnitude. And you can also see that every, uh, for every band, there are three passes, okay? So what we do is we will take what the neural network considers to be lenses, which we call recommendations. And then we look at these recommendations by eye to see which ones are, are likely uh, uh, gravitational lenses. All right. And uh, so I'm going to skip this as well, just a little bit more detail. And, uh, and so now we, so we run the run inference on 5.7 million objects and the neural network makes a bunch of recommendations. And then we're going to look at each recommendation by eye. So what are the criteria for this visual inspection process? Well, we look for blue galaxies, small blue galaxies next to red galaxy or galaxies. Sometimes it's a group of galaxies. Now, if it's a red galaxy next to a uh, uh, red galaxy, that's okay too, but it's rare. Um, and typically we want the separation between these small blue galaxies and the red galaxy in the center. We want the separation to be one between one and five arc seconds. We want them to look faint. We want them to curve towards the red galaxy at the center. And if there are multiple images, even better. And specifically, uh, if there's, um, if we see the Einstein cross configuration, 
uh, then it's very likely that it's a lensing instance. So I'm going to give you, give you an example uh, of a real observed system. So this is the lens. These are four images of the same background galaxy. You can see that they form this cross configuration. In this particular case, these lens images are actually red, not blue. As I said, that's OK. It's just you know they're rare. Uh, and also, we look for elongated images, right? So look, look at you know, that image is, is a very stretched, highly distorted image. Uh, the student members did the initial inspection. Uh, and then uh, myself and a postdoc in the supernova um, cosmology group, we finalized the candidate lists, the candidate list, and they're published uh, last year. So here are the candidates. This is the fun part. Uh, I'm sorry it took me this long to get through the technical side. I, I thought it would go quicker, but here we are. Um, so we found 335 candidates. And uh, let me point out a few objects that are rare. So typically, uh, a gravitational lens that's a galaxy uh, would create a very small separation between itself and the lens image. So here's an example. So the blue arc sort of hugs the lens, right? It's right next to it. Uh, large separations are rare. So this is why this is, this is a, 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 a even more rare system than that. And another reason I wanted to highlight this system is that most of the lenses that we found has this sort of orange color, which means they're relatively nearby. Whereas this guy is very, very red. So it tells it is a very high redshift lens. So here I have three high redshift lenses, all very red. And also we didn't uh, want to look for, um, we really want to look for galaxy scale lenses and not cluster or group scale lenses. So, so what do I mean by that? So this is a group lens. You see the lensing is caused not by one galaxy, but a group of galaxies. And here's the arc, right? So we didn't, really want to look for those. But nevertheless, we found systems like this. So this is an example. That's another example, right? This is a, there's a group of galaxy here. Together, they created this distorted image. So very exciting. And then we said, well, we did so well. Um, let's do it again. And uh, around that time, uh, DR8 was released. So here's DR8. As you can see, the observation is uh, basically complete. Uh, so before I talk about the DRA search, uh, Jamika, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Just uh, two, uh, two more questions from our chat, and I'll make these uh, quick here. Uh, first from Sovan, Sovan from Delhi, India. Sovan asks, <clears throat> is there any citizen science project related to your work? I am interested in participating in any citizen science opportunities. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So uh, the short answer to that is yes, we thought about this and the NASA actually has a program to do that. But uh, unfortunately last year we missed the deadline. Uh, so if we apply again this year and if we get it, we will be sure to advertise and, um, you know, and, uh, you know, feel free to contact me, um, <laughs> uh, you know, later this year, uh, I'll let you know uh, if, uh, if we get, uh, uh, you know, funding for, for, for the citizen science aspect of this project. Absolutely. Yes. Fantastic. That's fantastic. Okay. We'll definitely have to check back in with you on that for sure. And um, our next question is from another one from Ariel. <clears throat> and Ariel asks, uh, you know, do you have personal thoughts on dark energy? Uh, specifically, maybe what is causing it? And you can maybe add that to the end of your presentation yeah. if you'd like. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, I will do that. And if I forget, Jamika, please remind me. Thank you. No problem. All right. So DRA, so I'm going to speed up a bit. And so basically, we have improved our training sample. We've made the number of non lenses bigger, twice as big, almost. Uh, the number of lenses in the training sample is the same, but they're better. They have higher quality. All right, remember this number. Last time it was 0.98. Now we are able to achieve 0.992. And indeed, we, we do better. Uh, so very quickly, this time we deploy the trained neural network on 22 million objects. Remember, last time was 5.6. So this is more than three times uh, larger in number. 
And uh, so here is a subset of the lenses that we found. So this time we have found, uh, where was the number here? I guess I didn't show the total number here. Uh, so we found uh, 1,200 lenses uh, in total. And uh, the, we've assigned grades. Uh, grade A are the most likely candidates. Uh, grade B are still uh, basically with very high level confidence and C are uh, possible lenses. And uh, again, without going into too much detail, I'm gonna move on. So as you can see, they're really everywhere uh, all across the footprint. And uh, I can't believe I didn't show the number here and they must be shown somewhere. Okay, I'll just be patient here. So this, if you go to our paper, this is the breakdown of the different type of lenses that we found and uh, by grades as well. Um, okay. So uh, once again, I'm going to uh, skip this slide and come to the, yeah. So here is I show the number here. So we found the 1,210 new lenses, new candidate systems, and all of them are on the Google site. Anyone can uh, go there and look at our candidates. And, um, and the, most of them are galaxy scale lenses, but there are quite a few group and cluster lenses, which I'll show you and also uh, lens quasars, uh, which I haven't, time, haven't had the time to talk about. Uh, so let's just focus on these two bullet points. So here are uh, a few examples. These are uh, some of our best candidates. These candidates have large, at least one large arc in, in each case. This one has what's called a counter image on the other side. This is a near full ring, which is called the Einstein ring. Here are systems that have two images, two images, right? And here are images, here are systems that have four images or the Einstein cross, okay? Here are some of the cluster lenses. They're spectacular. Here's a huge arc, another large arc, another arc. This is a very thin arc. This one is, um, this one has four background galaxies. Uh, here's one. These four images, so let me start with one. So one, the white arrows correspond to four images of the same background galaxy. This is another background galaxy. This corresponds to another background, another background galaxy. And this one corresponds to the fourth background galaxy. Okay, uh, our systems have higher redshift, as you can see. Uh, so the red histogram uh, are our candidates compared with lenses that have been confirmed. Also, our systems have large Einstein radius. So what do I mean by Einstein radius? What I mean is that the separation between the lens and the lens image. All right, I really have to speed up. Um, so earlier there was a question about space telescope. So we applied for time on the Hubble Space Telescope and we got uh, approved. And uh, so far, 48 of our systems have been observed, and the 100% of them have been confirmed as lensing systems. And so here are some examples. These are as they are observed uh, from legacy surveys, and these are the HST images, right? I mean, they're much, much higher resolution, uh, and you can see the features of the arc very, very clearly, right? And uh, 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 right in each instance. So I'm going to blink a few times, you can see, okay. Uh, so these are systems that, oh, sorry, I blinked the wrong, there we go, okay. So in each of these systems, there's a single galaxy that acts as the main lens. Uh, there are 24 of, the, 24 of these. And then there are 24 systems that have uh, groups, several galaxies that act together as a lens. And so these are the HST images. You can see the beautiful elongated arcs, right? And again, I'm gonna blink a few times. Okay, all right. So uh, here we start to model these systems. It's a lot of fun to come up with a mathematical model for how the lensing takes place. I'm gonna have to skip these and uh, I'm gonna skip this as well. And then finally, I'll just show one example of uh, what Rob was talking about. So remember, we want to measure the redshifts of these systems to know how far away they are. So this object, for example, is, has already been observed by DESI. 
And if you zoom in on this part of spectrum, you see this characteristic feature uh, that's double peaked and it's oxygen two. So it tells you there's oxygen um, in this galaxy and the black is the model. I mean, look how good the fit is, right? So already uh, we are getting the distance information for these systems. And so I'll leave this as a conclusion. Uh, we found 1500 new lenses. Um, the future surveys uh, would allow us to discover uh, tens of thousands of lenses and we'll probably have to use machine learning techniques. And then we will able to use these systems to test dark matter model and uh, to search for lens supernovae in order to measure the uh, Hubble constant or the expansion rate of the universe. And uh, my personal view on dark energy is uh, a big I don't know uh, because all the theory models that, that uh, uh, people have proposed, uh, I think uh, most of my colleagues would agree with me that none seems satisfactory. So it's a big, huge mystery. So with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions from the YouTube audience, Jamika? Nope, that's it, Rob. Those were uh, fantastic uh, answers. Thank you so much. We got lots of thank yous and great presentation and great talk in the chat. So thank you so much for everyone uh, in the YouTube and our Facebook audience for joining us and for adding your comments and questions here in the chat for today's guest. Well, I'll add one comment from the Facebook page that I missed earlier. So, it was, so we sort of went past that part of the presentation. Um, just a historic, Martin Mackler, I'm hoping I say the name right, just a historical comment on the 1919 measurement of light deflection. He even said, no need to interrupt the talk. So I said, I mentioned at the, end of, at the end, it was indeed carried out by two English expeditions led by Eddington and collaborators. Eddington himself was at Prince Island in the West African coast. However, another expedition was sent to the town of Sobral, I may not be pronouncing that correctly, in northeastern Brazil. It turns out the data taken at Sobral was of superior quality, and for some reason, many current accounts tend to ignore Sobral's expedition, perhaps because Eddington was in Africa. However, the site of the Sobral expedition is mentioned very clearly in Eddington's original paper and abundantly documented. So just a little extra tidbit on the Eddington uh, experiment back in 1919. I, I was aware there were two expeditions, but I couldn't remember the places. So Martin obviously is a little bit better versed in this than I am. So, yeah, great, thanks. But thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you for having me. Yes. And before we sign off, Jamika, next week is live from Norlab at Gemini, correct? That's right, Rob. Next week um, we will have as our science guest. Uh, Gemini's chief scientist, Dr. Janice Lee. Uh, she will talk about her career path, um, how to become a professional astronomer, and uh, discuss her exploration of star formation in nearby galaxies. So join us uh, right here uh, next Wednesday um, here on the NordLab YouTube channel. That'll be 2 p.m. HST, 5 p.m. MST. Okay, thank you, Jamaica. And one more big thank you to our guest, Xiao Sheng Wang. That was absolutely fantastic. And obviously you had a very engaged and interested audience with all those questions and, and comments there. So thank you very much for a great presentation. A lot of fun. Okay, and we'll see you all next week and I'm gonna sign off now. Bye everybody.